Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's event. Event. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Fullylove. I'm the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. Let me first recognise my Chairman, Sir Frank Lowy. I'm delighted Frank could join us in New York this evening. Frank established the Institute in 2003 with the aim of deepening the debate in Australia and giving our country a greater voice abroad. In the past decade and a half, we've had a lot of success, but Frank is always nudging us to do more and to lift our sights higher, and that's not unrelated to the fact that we are now launching this brilliant new research product here in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a couple of other reasons that we're launching the Asia Power Index here in New York. First, we think Asia has never been more important to the United States and the world. Global wealth and power are moving eastwards towards Asia. Asia is where most of the world's economic growth will come from in future decades, but it's also the location of America's only true peer competitor, China, as well as a dangerous adversary, North Korea. And secondly, we believe this is a time when the United States should hear more from the world, when it should be more worldly. We would like to thicken the debate in this country on international developments. Some say that given the state of your debate, now is the time to do less in the United States. But we take the opposite view. We think it's time to do more, to talk more about Asia in the United States. Of course, it's a long way to come to launch a report on Asia, only to find out that on the very same day, the President of the United States is making a major statement on the Middle East. And I'd like to thank President Trump for being so welcoming and helpful. Um, it's not always easy to drag Americans' attention away from the Middle East and towards Asia. Sometimes it reminds me of the scene in Godfather Part Three, where Michael Corleone is trying to go legitimate. And he says, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. Uh, but we will not be distracted at the Lowy Institute. In the minute, I will introduce a terrific panel to talk about Asia. But first, I'd like to show you a video about the Asia Power Index. Asia is the locus of most of the Lowy Institute's work. Power is one of our preoccupations, and so it made sense to come up with some way of measuring power in Asia, of ranking Asian countries in terms of their power. Power is the capacity of states to influence the behavior of other states and the course of international events. The index ranks 25 countries in Asia across eight measures of power, 27 sub-measures, and 114 indicators. The eight measures of power are economic resources, military capability, resilience, which is a country's capacity to withstand threats to its stability, future trends, where we project forward a country's resources to 2030, diplomatic influence, economic relationships, defense networks, and cultural influence. The website allows users to explore the overall power rankings. You can also rank every country by individual measures. And compare countries side by side. The Power Index also has a weightings calculator that allows users to determine their own weightings for each of the measures.
Institute Asia Power Index will sharpen the debate about power in Asia, and future editions of the index will track how power shifts over time. So, ladies and gentlemen, we, we haven't exactly set ourselves a small task here. We're trying to measure a lot of different elements um, as, as part of quantifying power in Asia. And I'd like to acknowledge the work of Hervé Lemahieu and Bonnie Bly, as well as Alex Oliver and Anthony Bubalo in bringing this huge uh, project um, into, into shore. Now, we have the best possible panel this evening to discuss the Asia Power Index and Asian geopolitics, and I might invite them to the stage now if I can. Kevin, you're in the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, Susan Glasser, uh, closest to me, is a staff writer at The New Yorker, for which she writes a weekly column on the fire and fury of life in Washington during the Trump era. She joined The New Yorker from Politico, where she was the resident superstar. In my game, you simply must read everything Susan writes, and I'm particularly grateful that Susan has come up from Washington Today, given uh, President Trump's announcement, this must be like the end of the tax year is for an accountant. So thank you very much, Susan. To Susan's right is the Honourable Kevin Rudd. Kevin served as Australia's 26th Prime Minister and as Foreign Minister. He led Australia's response during the global financial crisis. He helped to expand the East Asia Summit and he ratified the Kyoto Protocol. He's now doing remarkable work as the President of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Thank you very much, Kevin, for being here, and thank you to you and your colleague, Deborah Eisenman, for your help with this event. To Kevin's right, we have Burhan Gafour. Burhan is Singapore's permanent representative to the United Nations and one of his country's best diplomats. He also served as press secretary to the Prime Minister, perm rep to the UN in Geneva, and high commissioner to Australia, which, of course, is the best of all those possible jobs. And finally, Hervé Lemahieu on the far right this evening, in, in any case, is a research fellow at the Institute and director of the Asia Power Index. Prior to joining the Lowy Institute, he worked on, on political economy and security at IISS in London. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the panel. Susan, I'm going to start with you, if I, if I may, and I'm going to ask you about the large pachyderm in the room. Um, what do you make of President Trump's big reveal today? Um, and what does it mean, do you think, for US foreign policy in relation to Asia? Is this going to mean that the United States is distracted by Asia? What can we learn from the way President Trump has made this decision when the rest of us are trying to predict how he will behave in, in East Asia? Well, thank you very much for having me, uh, and congratulations on your, your Asia Power Index. I, I do fear that I'm here as the sort of spoiler <laughs> who says to you reluctantly, well, stop trying to look for strategy and uh, method behind this. And I, I recently uh, found this out firsthand. I was uh, here in New York actually a few weeks ago and happened to be appearing with uh, a, a, someone who spent a lot of time with President Trump uh, in various uh, settings and really is a, a smart Trumpologist, as I've started to call them. And he was listening to the conversation in this TV green room and you know people were asking him questions about this, that, and the other thing. And he cut everybody off, uh, this Trump <laughs> advisor, and he said, you've got it all wrong. You know, I just, I need to tell you people, there is no strategy. There is no strategy. <coughs> and it was very vehement on this subject. He said, you know, you people in the press are always trying to, to make this out as if there's some complicated Machiavelli-like uh, plan here. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of that. I'm also thinking that 
the idea that there's an interconnection uh, between how President Trump is viewing uh, what he clearly intends to be a stepped-up campaign in a variety of ways uh, against Iran in the Middle East. Does that connect up with a larger geopolitical project? My guess would be no. He's obviously aware that there will inevitably be a linkage of some sort between this and the North Korea talks that are coming soon. Uh, that's been made clear to him, uh, and you already see him beginning to address that in his Twitter feed and, uh, for example, uh, making the point that uh, actually this is going to be good for his negotiations with North Korea in the view of uh, him and his advisors because it's going to show North Korea that a bad deal is not an option with Donald Trump. So, you know, he's already making a certain linkage, I would say, with Asia, but not necessarily of the kind of grand geopolitical ones that, that are usually discussed here at the Asia Society. Kevin, let me ask you, what do you think, first of all, what do you think Kim Jong-un and the North Koreans would take out of this lesson? Is there a lesson um, that America doesn't stick with its deals? And secondly, what do you think um, uh, that uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership would make of this? Is this another opportunity do you think, for the Chinese over the next couple of years to make hay while the United States focuses on the Middle East? Uh, <clears throat> firstly, Michael, welcome to our building here at the Asia Society. Uh, it's good that you've uh, chosen to be with us for the launch of what I think is an important report, uh, the Asia Power Index by the Lowy Institute. And uh, it would be wrong of me as a former Prime Minister of my country not to acknowledge Frank, who's here with us. Uh, Frank is an extraordinary story of, uh, for our country of what a uh, young Jewish refugee can do uh, when he lands in Australia <clears throat> in the middle of nowhere after the Second World War and builds an empire, and, uh, and then to give so much of it back philanthropically to institutions <laughs> such as the Lowy Institute. So, mate, good to have you in New York and good to have you at our place as well. Um, on your question, I think um, it's a while since I've spoken to Kim Jong-un. Um, <laughs> Uh, I haven't ever spoken to Kim Jong-un. <laughs> <laughs> and those of us who try to make a business of understanding how his brain ticks, uh, frankly, uh, having consulted both uh, Freud and Jung, uh, have come up blanks. But he's played a pretty smart tactical game so far, given the limited number of cards he has in his pack. If you're Kim Jong-un and you've managed to pull off summits with... Uh, the president of South Korea, two summits now with the Chinese president, an upcoming one with the president of the United States without having given anything away or put anything really on the table of substance. I think that's someone who's actually playing the game of poker reasonably well so far. <clears throat> I think the overall North Korean take, given that these people are very hardened, disciplined, experienced negotiators with Americans, going back over the three previous uh, exercises in reaching a near agreement with the United States on the future of the North Korean nuclear program is that Kim Jong-un will see this as a negotiating opportunity. <coughs> that is, given that America has now decided to renege on the uh, JCPOA, uh, the Iranian nuclear deal, uh, he will see this as an opportunity, I think, to drive an even harder bargain with the United States against the negotiating premise that the United States may not stick with its agreements. Mm -hmm. That's my overall mm -hmm. take in terms of the utility which they will make of this particular decision in Pyongyang. I don't think it frightens them at all um, because if the North Korean regime was frightened, they would have behaved in many different ways mm -hmm. over the last several decades. Um, this is a tough totalitarian regime. I think that's the first point. The second is, how would Xi Jinping uh, view this? I find it difficult to judge um, how the Chinese would have played this prior to uh, the decision. Uh, I and others have been urging the Chinese leader to place a telephone call to the American president over the last couple of weeks to urge upon him the need to stay uh, with the Iranian nuclear deal simply because of the potential jeopardy in which it places any possible future deal with North Korea. Um, I'm not aware that that communication has occurred. I think there's been arrangements for a telephone call actually today, and now that the decision has been made between those two leaders. 
Overall, I would think on balance the Chinese will see this as a retrograde step um, because it makes <clears throat> the potential enforceability of any regime which the North Koreans uh, would agree to to be more problematic in the execution given what the Chinese already say are the vicissitudes of US domestic politics. They can't sign an agreement and stick to it. Look at the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Look at the Iranian nuclear deal. Now look at whatever might, might happen over North Korea. As to whether the Chinese see this as a further strategic opportunity of America being in global dis diplomatic disarray, I think that is now uh, taken as a strategic given uh, in China. They see the United States as being all over the place uh, in the current administration. Uh, they see uh, the fracturing of U.S. Uh, traditional alliances uh, both in Asia <coughs> and in Europe uh, over a whole range of different questions. Uh, <coughs> if you look at the fracture points, it's not just this on as it presents itself on Iran. More recently, it's been what has happened on uh, trade and more recently, again, what's happened uh, on uh, climate change. So the Chinese see this as an opportunity to, frankly, um, uh, I won't say exploit American uh, weaknesses, but simply to move into vacuums, uh, which they now see as opening up. My final point, in case uh, I haven't been clear about my own view about the President's decision, is that I think on Iran, is I think it's completely nuts, uh, <laughs> just with a capital N. I mean, I am no supporter of the Iranian state, uh, the activities of Iran in supporting international terrorist organizations through Hezbollah and Hamas and the rest, I am fundamentally, ideologically, practically, politically, strategically opposed to and would do every, anything possible to deal with those as terrorist organizations anywhere in the world. But that is a separate matter to dealing with Iran's nuclear capabilities, which is what the JCPOA is all about. Let me ask you one more question, Kevin, about US-China competition, which you touched on there. The, the finding of the, the power index is the US remains the top dog in the region with a Just lot of... Just checking to see you got it right. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Always good to have fact checkers in the era of fake news. That's what you do after you've been a prime minister to become a fact checker. <laughs> so we, the index finds the US is the top dog, but China is closing fast. And some of the US strengths are its alliance networks, its defence networks in the region, um, and so on. I guess what I'd like to ask you is how, how well qualified do you think President Trump is in this power, to lead the United States in this power competition with China? Because one thing we observe is that he's not very enthusiastic about many of America's traditional strengths in Asia, whether it's the alliance network, whether it's free trade agreements, whether it's the, the cultural influence of the American press, for example. How do you think, how would you, how would you handicap Trump and Z as leaders in this power competition? Well, <clears throat> Xi Jinping is a strategist, um, and Trump is Trump. Um, uh, and I, Xi Jinping um, is a keen student of Chinese domestic politics, a keen student of international politics, a keen student of Chinese power. By the way, this publication of yours, Hervé, should do very well in China because the methodology used to calculate um, uh, power within this power index is very similar to the one used domestically by the Chinese, which is <clears throat> the comprehensive assessment of national power or comprehensive national power, which the Chinese internally use to assess the rest of us. It's just that it's not been published publicly for about <laughs> 15 years ever since China started to rise to the top of the pile. Um, so this should <coughs> sell very well. Make sure you put a good markup mm -hmm. on it mm -hmm. in the Chinese translation. I think the Chinese perception of Trump is along these lines. Strategically, they regard the Trump administration as an enormous opportunity for China, consistent with what I said before. They see vacuums and spaces opening up around the world in all regions through the absence of an effective American diplomacy, as well as <clears throat> in key institutions, uh, whether it's uh, the United Nations or whether it's the Climate Change Convention or even NATO for that matter. At the same time, and here's the qualifying point, they find str Trump, st Trump strategically comforting and tactically terrifying. Mm. 
And why do I say that? Tactically terrifying because they actually do not know which way he will jump. And so to give President Trump his due, for example, on the trade matter, where there is an unsustainable trade deficit uh, between China and the United States in the vicinity <coughs> of about $400 billion a year and growing. Up until now, by and large, uh, China has waved that through and said, well, the Americans will jump up and down about this. Uh, until this administration, when he has jumped up and down and begun to indicate what national measures the United States would take, and he has now grasped China's attention. What the Chinese will now do in response, because it's now a visit by the Chinese Vice Premier Liu He uh, to, uh, to Washington again in terms of their response to the most recent uh, demand for measures mm -hmm. in the Mnuchin visit to Beijing in the last uh, week or so, I don't know. But tactically, when I say terrifying, is that they do not know which way this guy will jump. And China prefers strategic predictability, <laughs> not uncertainty. And they are very uncertain about this guy. So that's the cocktail, I think. Burhan, let me bring you in on that, if I, <laughs> if I may. Um, strategically comforting, but tactically terrifying. There may be a bit of tactical terror that allies and friends of the United States, such as Singapore, feel about Mr Trump's behaviour as well. The, the Asia Power Index finds that Singapore is an overachiever, someone that uses its resources in a very intelligent way, a hyper-connected country, right, strategically located, but therefore also having not only a strong relationship with the United States, but a very complicated relationship mm. with China. Mm. So strengths and vulnerabilities are, are flip sides of each other, if you like. How, as a Singaporean diplomat over the last couple of decades, how have you observed the US-China relationship changing? How much more difficult is it for a country like Singapore to navigate its way uh, in this era of heightened competition between China and the United States? Well, thank you very much, Michael, uh, first of all, for inviting me, um, and Kevin for also joining us. I always feel at home at Asia Society, especially in the company of Australian friends. Um, Second, let me also add my voice of congratulations on the Asia Power Index, Michael. I think it's a useful uh, analytical tool, uh, not just for academics, but also for policymakers in terms of conceptualizing uh, different aspects of power and influence and also observing trends um, that are happening in the region. And the report is right in saying that in many sense, the center of gravity or the locus is shifting to Asia Pacific. Um, it's not something that is unknown or new. I mean, we all knew that, but it puts in a, uh, a, a framework in terms of measurements and indicators that I think is um, uh, useful. In terms of your question, um, US-China relation, uh, I think it has always been the central relationship uh, in the international system, um, managing the U.S.-China uh, relationship uh, for both the U.S. and for China um, has been uh, the biggest issue and the biggest challenge for each of them. I think what has changed over the decades is the level of complementarity that has emerged in the relationship. So it's no longer just competition between the U.S. and China, but the uh, aspect of interdependence and complementarity between the U.S. Um, and the Chinese economies, uh, for example, that are so essential for uh, their relationship. Uh, it is true that the um, advent of the Trump administration has introduced um, uh, uncertainties uh, in the relationship. But, you know, for friends of the U.S. and China in the region, um, it's about managing uh, not just the competition, but also uh, the complementarity at what we have been trying to do in Asia or Southeast Asia is use regional processes and institutions to mitigate and stabilize the relationship by engaging all the major powers, not just the US and China, but I would also say um, Australia, which is very much a part of the region, Japan, Korea, as well as India, all of whom feature in your Asia Pacific Index. And that is where the role of ASEAN and ASEAN-related uh, institutions play an important role, in my view, in stabilizing um, and mitigating the edges of competition and also um, letting it be known that both sides can work together by working with partners in the region. Um, so 
that is, is what I would say, uh, Michael. Hervé, let me, let me bring you in. You've spent um, a couple of years down in the data. Um, what, let me invite you to, to, to make any comments about US-China competition, but also tell us um, what else really surprised you out of the index mm -hmm. when, you, when you pulled up out of the figures? And, and perhaps talk to us a little bit about North Korea as well, because, because that's a quite a surprising result in some ways. Sure. Thanks, Michael. Uh, firstly, on the subject of, of US and China, just to add a dimension which hasn't been talked about yet, um, uh, one of the more surprising results was that the military balance works, still works decisively in the United States' favor uh, in Asia, despite uh, what we've been told even by US authorities, um, including uh, Admiral Philip Davidson, who's the, the next uh, commander of the US Pacific Command, that China controls effectively the South China Sea in all scenarios, barring a war with the United States. Um, but, and, and China has become the second largest defense vendor uh, comfortably in the world. But let's just keep in mind here what the US brings to the table. Uh, it still has uh, almost three times as much defense spending um, in terms of uh, its actual maritime assets in Asia, 83 destroyers and cruisers versus 31 uh, of all other Asian uh, navies combined. So it really is a decisive lead. And on, on, on top of that, um, it might be a legacy effect. It might be something that Trump is, is skeptical of. But the defense network that the US has in Asia really is unmatched by Beijing and, and seems to be um, something that, that Beijing would love to have at some point, uh, but is unable to, uh, particularly because its, its, its geographical landscape or its political landscape is, is, is challenged by countries like India uh, or Southeast Asian countries like Vietnam with whom it has boundary disputes. And until those things are resolved, um, I think that China uh, is actually uh, in, 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 you know, in more trouble uh, in terms of trying to level with the United States in, in the military balance of power in Asia. Now, now moving on to North Korea, um, one of the interesting findings of the index, uh, and I think it should be a wake-up call really, um, was that uh, North Korea ranks 17th um, in terms of our assessment of power. Partly that's down to the fact that we uh, take a very broad, wide-ranging view of power. Um, we acknowledge um, that it is a top five um, military power in Asia, that it is dangerous in that sense, that it has invested all its eggs in one basket, in fact, in one element of that basket, which is nuclear capability and its intercontinental ballistic missile range. But let's not forget um, that it has a GDP that's smaller than Laos, uh, one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia, despite having five times the population of Laos, um, that uh, it essentially operates or has to operate as a criminal syndicate in terms of its economic relationships in the region, that it is chronically dependent on China, 87% of its trade is with China, uh, which really reduces um, its, its uh, maneuverability uh, if Beijing gets cross with it. Um, and for all those reasons, I think we, 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 we probably under or, or overestimate North Korea's power. Um, as Kevin was mentioning, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un has been very effective at promoting his country's diplomatic interests with the little resources he has, and there's ingenuity there, and that's recognized in our political leadership indicator. But on all other fronts, it is a brittle state, um, and there are dangers, I think, in US policy reducing um, Asia to the dimension of North Korea, which, which seems to be the preoccupation of Trump insofar as he thinks of Asia. Well, Susan, on that, let me ask you how, how Washington thinks about Asia. Um, I mean, for a, a few years ago, President Obama announced a grand pivot, actually announced it in, the par in Parliament House in, in Canberra. Uh, he said that, that this was a great new strategic doctrine for the ages, but it seems to have been one that in fact, didn't survive one transition of one administration. Um, is there any sense that, um, that was, is there anything lasting out of the pivot? How much do um, foreign policy makers in Washington think about Asia? Uh, and perhaps finally, how do you think um, perceptions of Kim are changing in Washington? Is there a sense that he's moving, we're sort of moving beyond these outlandish caricatures and actually mm -hmm. Perhaps he's a much more formidable leader than perhaps we had assumed. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack in there. I Just on the pivot to Asia, I, I would argue that it didn't even really last Obama's own announcement tour 
of it. Uh, I believe that there was a, immediately, as I recall on that trip, a, a crisis of some sort in the Middle East, uh, which underscored it. And actually, at the time, I was the editor of Foreign Policy magazine. And before President Obama announced it, uh, this doctrine was actually rolled out in the pages of Foreign Policy in an article by Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me just say that it was a, quite a diplomatic uh, back and forth uh, on the part of your editor here uh, in order to keep the phrase pivot to Asia in that article, which we did successfully do, uh, only to have uh, the gang at the Obama White House in the NSC decide that that was actually going to upset a lot of people. So actually, the pivot to Asia didn't even survive mm -hmm. the Obama White House. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that tells you a lot. We're not uh, in a moment of American leadership where uh, grand strategies, uh, no matter how carefully thought through and written down and announced, uh, shape really much. And, you know, think about the fate of the national security strategy uh, that was just prepared and released by Trump's second national security advisor, uh, General H.R. McMaster. Uh, arguably, uh, not only is H.R. McMaster already gone, uh, but it didn't even survive the President Trump's announcement of the national security strategy, which talked about uh, China and Russia in the same uh, uh, paragraph, twinned them together, and talked about the rise of a renewed great power competition as the new framing and animating doctrine of American national security. Well, when President Trump announced this strategy, a 70-page document, not only did he not uh, uh, repeat or endorse the language that was in there, but uh, at least when it came to Russia, he actually talked in that speech uh, about the great partnership with Russia that he wanted to forge and that he saw as the basis of American policy. So right now, look, obviously everyone here at this point is clued in to the notion that there is uh, an emerging Trump administration foreign policy on various subjects, and I think that probably includes Asia. And then there's the president's own views, and those uh, often are not in alignment. He has now very recently installed a new team uh, in Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and John Bolton at the National Security Council, who may be more in line uh, with some of the president's thinking on some of these issues. Uh, but for Trump, it's clear trade is how he thinks about Asia uh, and is the frame and the lens through which he has viewed foreign policy. Now, there's also the very personal drama that he's constructed uh, with Kim Jong-un and North Korea and turning it into a, a strategic and a military conversation as well. But I think fundamentally, if you want to understand Trump and Asia, you need to look at his very long-held views uh, that go back to the 1980s uh, and are very much about trade. And again, very consistent with a worldview that uh, includes both Asia and our European allies when it comes to the notion that the world is out there screwing the United States. Uh, and you know, I found it fascinating uh, in my reconstituted role as a Kremlinologist these days, I found it quite fascinating uh, that even when uh, Chancellor Merkel was in Washington, uh, not even two weeks ago, 10 days ago, appearing by the president's side, he, he referred once again to NATO and the idea that the United States had gotten nothing of benefit from the NATO alliance over its 70 years, but that in fact it was really only benefiting Europe. And so I think if I was looking for a way to understand uh, how is the president viewing Asia, I would think, one, that he is able to maintain a separation in his head between uh, North Korea and the coming summit with Kim, uh, and his longer-term plans or thinking around continuing to pressure China and other economies in the region uh, whom he views as having unfair advantages over the United States, that those, uh, I don't think there's a linkage uh, for him, and I think he does intend to pursue, uh, call it Bannonism, uh, or call it Trumpism, but I think that he's never wavered uh, from that as being actually one of his core uh, beliefs. I'm going to go to the audience in a second, give you an opportunity to ask questions, but Kevin, can I ask you one question, um, if I can leave Mr. Trump just for one second. 
Um, in your current role as head of the Asia, Asia Society Policy Institute, you're talking, I guess, principally to Americans about Asia, but in a way this has been a theme of your, your whole life, it seems to me. You've been uh, explaining Asia, as it were, to the United States and, and US friends. Is there any sense in your mind that the debate in the United States on Asia has changed, that, um, that uh, especially that China mm -hmm. is, is setting off alarm bells? I mean, we had, um, we had a US general just a couple of days ago in Canberra, for example, saying that he'd just been to China, and the thing is the Chinese still respect America, but they no longer fear us, for example. Is it changing, do you think? Is the debate changing, and is that in a positive way or a negative way? I think if you're trying to characterize what's happening in Washington at the moment um, on China and China policy, uh, there has been an almost unconscious uh, circling of the wagons, um, by which I mean whether it's the national security uh, policy establishment, foreign policy establishment, the intelligence community, corporate America, NGOs. Uh, those concerned about human rights, <clears throat> it's very difficult to identify any supportive constituency for China in Washington at present. Mm -hmm. um, there has now been a hardening of the position mm -hmm. for different reasons, mm -hmm. but overlapping reasons. So that creates a, an environment where uh, what we would historically have called a... Uh, balanced policy towards China, which was uh, based on uh, a doctrine of uh, engage, but at the same time uh, maintaining strategic vigilance, mm -hmm. is becoming much more one of strategic vigilance, preparation, and I won't say confrontation, but heading in that direction with less emphasis on engagement, if I was to try and characterize it. I think the view in Beijing on the flip side of the coin, um, and I try to spend as much time there as possible just to understand other perceptions of reality. Uh, the flip side of the coin uh, is that the Chinese, I think, are concluding that there has been a fundamental hardening of America's core position towards China in all areas. In other words, they've made, I think, an accurate conclusion. Um, and secondly, um, there is a period, I think, of uh, flux now in Beijing as to what to do about it. Um, and whether it is simply to ignore uh, the Trump administration to the extent that they can in the hope that a combination of the American midterm elections, Robert Mueller, the American people, or whatever, um, dispose of this president in one way or another. Um, there's another group in Beijing who's saying, you want to bring it on? Well, bring it on. Uh, and that's been very much alive in the recent uh, debate <coughs> over trade measures. There's a lot of Chinese nationalism at play domestically on that as well. Uh, through to another constituency which says, um, let's... Um, uh, deal with this immediate problem, try and give the Americans what they want on the trade front, try to be cooperative on North Korea, and simply continue to buy strategic time until the overall correlation of the power index is much more decisively in China's favour. Which of those three constituencies prevails in Beijing is an open question. I think at present more likely the third. Um, and evidenced by the fact that another high-level emissary is heading to, Beige, uh, heading to Washington in the days ahead. All right, let me give the audience an opportunity to ask a question. Um, we have some microphones here, so please put up your hand if you'd like to, to ask a question. So I'll, I'll recognise this gentleman first. Can I ask you to state your name and your affiliation before you ask your question, please? Sure. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm uh, Ankit Panda with The Diplomat magazine. Um, I, I noticed in the power index uh, that Japan was pleasantly ranked as one of the overachieving countries in the region. Um, that's certainly not my impression from recent trips to Tokyo, where I think there's a great deal of anxiety about Tokyo's future role. 
Um, I just wanted to, this is an open question to anybody on the panel that would want to um, speak to this question, but uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, about, about the prospects uh, <laughs> for Japan in the uh, Indo-Pacific region um, through 2050, uh, what Tokyo should be doing. I think this is an interesting question given Prime Minister Abe's political fortunes turning down now and the uncertainty ahead there, but I'd be very curious for any impressions on, on Tokyo as well. So, Hervé, let's go to you first. Uh, already the Japanese press is, is, is um, feeling a bit pumped up by, by Japan's uh, performance. Why, why, did you, why did the index give Japan pretty good marks? Look, I, I think it's, it's a question of, it's a, it's a glass half full rather than a glass half empty. It's how, how you look at it. There's no question that Japan faces two things. I mean, on the one hand, we do recognize it as an overachiever. It is actively involved in terms of its trade, in terms of its investment in Southeast Asia. It is recognized as a cultural influencer. Um, we pick that up in terms of internet search trends across the region. Japan is by far the most popular searched country uh, on Google uh, in, in at least 10 countries in Asia. Um, and tops you know, our cultural influence score. So all of those uh, influence measures uh, uh, actually indicate to us that Japan is performing better than we'd expect it to on the basis of its distribution of resources. Now that's where the headache comes in for Tokyo because its distribution of resources is in relative, if not absolute, decline. So in terms of its uh, uh, economic stature, uh, it's, it's leveled. Um, but uh, relative to the rise of all the others, uh, it's really shrinking as a proportion of the overall Asian economy. Demographically, it's an absolute decline. So those things really ferment quite a lot of anxiety and probably explain the prevailing mood in, in Tokyo. On top of that, there is the issue of uh, waning credibility in U.S. defense commitments and in the alliance, particularly what they see happening on the Korean Peninsula uh, with a possible rapprochement between the North Koreans and the U.S. as a possible means of enacting a U.S. retrenchment from the region. Now, this is all hypothetical, but they are very alarmed by this um, and uh, are, are looking at means of, of, of hedging uh, against the prospects of, of, of U.S. withdrawal from the region. That's difficult because they have a difficult relationship with South Korea and other East Asian giants. All right. Who else would like to ask... A question, yeah, I see Thomas Gomar. Thank you very much. So, Thomas Gomar, I'm the director of the Free French Institute for International Relations. Thank you for, for this uh, power index, very interesting. An observation about Russia, very quickly, which is presented as ASEAN power. I think it's it was reminding that you know 80% of the Russian population is located west of Urals, so may maybe to, to nuance this, this vision. Now, my question is, seated in Europe, I would be very interested in getting your, your views about the evolution of the relation between the US, Japan, India, and Australia, because this squad has some uh, strategic ambitions, and what sort of uh, evolution could we, uh, could, could we expect in this, uh, in this regard? Thank you. Kevin, I might ask you to have a run at that. What do you think? What do you think about the quad? That's a <coughs> good non-controversial question. <laughs> the um, uh, well, in the great traditions of Australian diplomacy, let me take it head on. Um, uh, in two thousand and eight, I opposed the quad as prime minister. Uh, there were good reasons for it. Um, and the reasons then <coughs> uh, was that. We, as a newly elected government, uh, had a view that uh, the Indian government of Manmohan Singh uh, was at best half committed, that there are already wobbles within the LDP uh, during the first Abe government, which had just come to an end, and that as for the DPJ, we knew for a fact from our diplomatic reporting that they were not committed and they were on track to win the subsequent elections, which they did. Interestingly, in my engagements then with uh, President Bush, uh, which covered every subject known to man, uh, including Iraq, Afghanistan, everything else, never once did he ever raise any concerns with me about our position in not proceeding with the Quad, which had only been announced as an idea um, about six months the way through 2007 from memory. 
So um, the idea that you would somehow adopt a position strategically then when you had uncertain partners struck me as problematic. Secondly, um, China as of 2008 had not exhibited uh, the characteristics of a more assertive regional foreign and security policy by that stage. And thirdly, um, an enduring question is this for an Australian national interest. Do you wish to be permanently in the position, at least back then, of permanently anchoring Australia's future national interests with China based on the future evolution of the China-Japan relationship in particular? This was at a time when Abe was regularly visiting the uh, Yakusuni Shrine. Uh, that the uh, LDP had a particular view of Japan's wartime role uh, in China. Uh, and it was, and to some extent has remained, a highly toxic relationship for a re range of historical factors over which we Australians, and for that matter the Indians, had no leverage, no control. But if you're looking to a long-term strategic partnership involving these three powers, was it therefore wise to simply rest your strategic chips with one of those partners who had an as yet unresolved bilateral relationship uh, with uh, the Chinese, uh, with the, between themselves and the Chinese. As for the future, what I find interesting is this. Um, one, what are my observations about uh, Abe Mark II? Uh, yes, uh, full uh, embrace of Quad Mark II, it seems. But underneath that umbrella, for those of us who watch it carefully, has for the last 12 months or so embarked upon a very solid uh, strategy of uh, diplomatic and political normalization with Beijing. In fact, if you want to see a <coughs> remarkable shift in Japanese policy, it's gone from opposition to support and co-participation in the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and there is now, for the first time in several years, a trilateral meeting between the three countries' prime ministers, uh, Abe, together with his Japanese and Chinese counterparts, although Li Keqiang, not Xi Jinping. Flip it to Delhi, we've just had a two-day uh, unstructured summit, the first in three years, uh, between uh, Modi and Xi Jinping in Wuhan, all about the future of the relationship. And the calculus in Delhi, I think, is one along the lines of, well, we don't want to end up in some sort of isolated position here of being too hard out against uh, Beijing in partnership with our possible quad partners. Um, therefore, we, like the Japanese, will hedge against the hedge. Uh, and, uh, and having tilted right, now tilt left, or gone from hard, we'll go to medium, medium soft boiled. Uh, and as a result, you then see uh, that position being quite nuanced. Go to the third element of the equation, and any Australian diplomat at this point, a professional diplomat, should close their ears because I'm about to say something against the Australian government, um, which is along these lines. Uh, Prime Minister Turnbull, by contrast, has gone out there hard, sharp, and very direct against Beijing with a whole series of rhetorical statements about, uh, about uh, China, including its regional behavior, but also China um, and agents of the Chinese state uh, being active in undermining the nature of the Australian democracy. So he's gone right out there, uh, while frankly everyone else is playing a much more nuanced position. So under those circumstances, I would simply say to policymakers at this stage, when you're looking at the future evolution of something called the Quad, be very mindful of the more nuanced diplomacy being deployed by your would-be partners. Burhan, can I ask you, um, speaking of nuanced diplomacy, <coughs> um, I mean, one of the, I guess the idea at the heart of the Quad is that um, democracies are working together in a way. Um, Singapore, of course, is not a member of the Quad, but Singapore is a stakeholder in the liberal international order, and we do all find ourselves in the situation where we have a president who is neither liberal nor international nor orderly uh, in his behaviour, um, what, what should countries like Singapore and, and Australia do until the fever breaks in Washington? If there's a period that we're in at the moment where 
um, where the United States is in a more, more nationalistic mode. What can the rest of us who have benefited from this US-led order for so long, what can we do to support the order until the fever passes? Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Just a few points listening to the various um, comments um, here. First, I think there's a distinction between policy rhetoric that comes out of Washington, D.C., and actual U.S. actions on the ground. And for policymakers in Southeast Asia, and at least in Singapore, we are actually seeing more continuity than change. Um, let's be clear about that. I think the one area where there has been discontinuity is in the area of trade. Mm -hmm. And the decision to withdraw from the TPP uh, was significant. But even there, even the, the, the door is not entirely closed. It was opened briefly and shut, and it's still slightly ajar on the question of the US joining uh, the TPP at some stage. Secondly, I think uh, there is more pragmatism uh, in, in statements uh, from Washington, D.C. than meets the eye in the sense that ultimately, um, you know, the Americans are making some hard calculations, the Trump administration, and so uh, all of us in Asia, um, you know, in Singapore, in ASEAN, and no doubt uh, in Australia and other places. Um, and as we look at the nuanced diplomacy um, happening around the region, as you put it, uh, Kevin, if you look at the um, US-China relationship, I mean, there's a series of dialogue process that's happening. Um, US-India, India-China, uh, Japan-China, uh, Korea-Japan, uh, Korea-China. So a lot's happening on the ground, and things haven't uh, come to a standstill as a result of some policy uncertainty. Uh, things, are, things are happening. Um, uh, now, what, what can we do? I, I think I would say two things. The first would be that those who are advocates and who have benefited from a multilateral rules-based system need to continue to advocate that, uh, whether it's in the domain of trade. Um, countries like Australia and Singapore particularly are firm advocates and believers of the multilateral trading system. I think we need to continue to make the case Firstly, with our American friends, and secondly, um, at the WTO, and also within the region um, to make the case for it. Number two, to continue the work of liberalization that needs to be done. Um, I think we in ASEAN are talking about an ASEAN-EU free trade agreement. We in Singapore are talking about a Singapore-Mercosur uh, free trade agreement. So the work on trade liberalization uh, need not come to a halt and should not come to a halt um, just because some of the positions coming out of Washington, D.C. <coughs> is, uh, is, is very hesitant about this. I, I think we should continue uh, this project of trade <coughs> liberalization. And the last thing I would say is, is the whole thing about the ASEAN architecture. Uh, um, as we are chairing ASEAN now, uh, and, and we have always been a firm believer in, in ASEAN, we need to keep that ASEAN-led processes uh, going because they are exercises in confidence building. They are networks uh, that encourage cooperation and dialogue, including with the United States, I would say. So the United States hasn't shut the door to ASEAN or the ASEAN-US relationship. Um, there will be an ASEAN summit uh, later this year. We expect all the dialogue partners will be there, we hope, including uh, President Trump. So the U.S. engagement in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, from what I see, um, has not come to an end. The U.S. remains the preeminent power, major economic partner for countries in the region. So there's a lot that happens um, uh, at the regional level, at the technical level, uh, so it's really important to distinguish the, the Twitter feeds from the headlines and action on the ground. But the Twitter feeds are so much more fun. <laughs> Not Lad so much for diplomats. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our time. Um, we have a drink uh, next door, so please stay around, have a drink. We have the Asia Power Index set up on computers, so you're very welcome to...
have a go, have a play with the index. But before you do that, first of all, let me join in thanking, join me in thanking the panelists for a really terrific discussion. I would like to thank you all for coming. Those who are watching online, thank you for watching. I'd like to thank the Asia Society and Kevin and his team for hosting us tonight. I'd like to thank my team. Uh, it's quite a big effort for a small think tank to run a project like this and then to launch it in New York City. So I'd like to thank them. And finally, I do want to thank President Trump. Uh, I know that I did it perhaps with a smile on my face at the beginning of, of the event. Um, for, for trying to derail uh, tonight's uh, Asia Power Index. He was so worried about the results that he had to resort to desperate measures. But actually, I do want to thank him because whether or not he is good for Asia, whether or not President Trump is good for the world, he is definitely good for think tanks. He drives an enormous amount of interest and viewers. So thank you also, President Trump. Thank you.